Holy Communion around the table. It's good to be with you. It's good to be with you on the live stream. For those that are new uh, here, we want you to know that uh, we are serving nothing but Jesus Christ here today. And so we want you to be served him and to meet our risen and living Savior. He is uh, what we have to offer you. We want to know how to serve you better as you listen on the live stream. There's a a connect card online that you can fill out. And there's a newcomer pew card that will also tell you uh, about what it looks like to come and worship with our church in person. And as we uh, continue through COVID tide, as I'm now calling it, Chad liked that this morning, COVID tide, uh, just a reminder that worshiping online is a, a beginning point. It's not an ending point. Amen. God intends that we worship physically and be part of a a, a community where uh, there's relationships and uh, godly leadership and places to serve and all the rest. And so while uh, worshiping online out of necessity is is just great, we just thank God for what he's done and how he's enabled us to be together as a church family. Uh, Please take that as a beginning point this morning and not as an ending point. Well, I'm excited today to move on in our Exodus big read uh, into the Passover, into the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and what's also the last plague. So as we look at that today, let's go ahead and go to prayer, and uh, you're welcome to get Exodus 11 through 13 open to you today as we do. Oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts here today be pleasing to you, our rock, our redeemer. Amen. If you've seen the Passion of the Christ, you might remember that haunting scene with the two Marys. It's towards the beginning of the movie, right after Jesus has been arrested in the garden. Of course, the two Marys are Mary Magdalene and the Mary, uh, Mary the mother of Jesus. It's nighttime. It's Good Friday Eve. It's Passover week, right? And Mary Magdalene whispers to the Mary, why is this night different from all others? And Mary's reply, the Mary's reply, is because once we were slaves and we are no longer. Those words are from the Passover Haggadah, uh, retold, Every Passover by Jewish families around the world, still today, Haggadah means uh, to tell. To tell. It is the recollection of uh, God's deliverance out of Egypt and the the particular, we can only, only call it the peculiar way, and the powerful way in which this rescue was accomplished Looking at this through the lens of Jesus, it is a story that Christians everywhere that we hear this morning share in. In fact, I believe when we come to these chapters in Exodus, we are looking at the greatest true story ever told. It touches the human condition in a way that no other story can. In fact, I would argue that we are retelling elements of the Passover story all the time. All the time. We're are, we are tell, retelling elements of the Passover and Exodus story all the time in our own stories. I'll pause here for a moment. I'll just say there are three threads that I want us to pull out a little bit from this story and look at more closely The first thread is substitution and sacrifice. Substitution and sacrifice. So what do I mean when I say that I think that we're retelling in our stories this central story all the time? Well, how many of the last 50 years of top movies have had the elements of substitution and sacrifice at the center of them? All of them. All of them. Let me just name four. Avatar. And by the way, I'm not saying these movies like capture Christian theology perfectly or anything like that. I'm not saying that. This is Hollywood people. But there's an element here. Avatar. Titanic. Ever heard of it? 
deeply moving, incredibly well seen at the movies. Why? Because of substitution and sacrifice. Star Wars, ever heard of it? Avengers, ever heard of it? Substitution and sacrifice are at the center of some of what are our, I don't know about, maybe not greatest is like an overstatement, but our most popular stories. We could go on and on and on. Oh, why is this? Well, whether we know it or not, I think our best beloved dramas, whether they happen on planet Earth or in um, some other universe long, long ago, they liberally borrow from the drama of the cross, friends. We can't get away from it. It's as if we have no other story to tell. They borrow from God's drama. God's drama. It is, as Lewis put it when he wrote, of Aslan's death, the deeper magic of God. It is the story that he has placed at the center of creation. We may try to tell other stories, and I know nihilism is just like rampant in our culture today, but we know there's no power in those stories. We know there's no direction in those stories. We're drawn back to the deeper magic of God in substitution and sacrifice, as strange as it is. The exchange of one person for another is at the heart of God. Is at the heart of God. This was, in fact, his saving purpose in Christ Jesus before the world began. Before the world began. Tim Keller gives one storyline example that you know, you could, has been repeated again and again and again in hundreds of movies and books. It's a storyline that you'll uh, recognize, and just, we, we just can't stop doing it. This is from The Reason for God. Imagine you come into contact with a man who's innocent, but uh, who is being hunted down by secret agents or by the government or some other powerful group. He reaches out to you for help. If you don't help him, he will probably die. But if you ally with him, you, who are perfectly safe and secure, will be in mortal danger. This is the stuff that movie plots are made of. Again, it's him or you. He will experience increased safety and security through your involvement, but only because you are willing to enter into his insecurity and vulnerability. How can God be a God of love if he does not become personally involved in suffering the same violence? oppression, grief, weakness, and pain that we experience? The answer to that question, says Keller, is twofold. First, God can't. Second, only one major world religion even claims that God does. Powerful. So it is that the Lamb's blood is put on the lentil in the doorpost of every Israelite home in Egypt. See, the lamb is not an end in and of itself. The story doesn't end there. It's at the center, but it doesn't end there. How could a lamb be a substitute for a human life? And we need to remember here that there was loss in Egypt. There was loss in Israel. The Egyptians lost their for, uh, firstborn because of the judgment of God. This was the last plague. The Israelites lose a lamb. Well, how could a lamb be a substitute for a human life? But the lamb, as a shadow of good things to come, proclaims that there is one who is coming who will be the perfect sacrifice. And that God's intent in giving the Passover is that when this true sacrifice arrives, when the substance replaces the shadow, when the man darkens the doorway of this world, we should be able to plainly recognize him and say, ah yes, this is the true lamb. And so John the Baptist cries, behold the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. God's self-substitution 
for our sin. Christ in our place, friends, is gloriously and wondrously at the center of Scripture. You see, we're saying this all the time in our stories, and the point I want to make here is that this sacrifice being at the heart of Christianity is not a liability to be managed. It's not something to apologize for. Because it's what we're longing for, whether we know it or not. This is rather a glorious reality to embrace and proclaim to others. The true Paschal Lamb has arrived, and you can be covered in his blood. It's so strange. You know, those words are so foreign. And yet they're what Paul said to the Corinthian church. What did he say to them in the reading that Karen read for us? Christ, our Passover lamb, has been what? Sacrificed. And that was a church of Gentile Christians. And that tells you how Paul was catechizing them. That he took such a thing, as so foreign probably to them, and made it the center. And it connected for them. And they were able to see God's goodness and grace and mercy and forgiveness. God can do the same in our culture today. Christ, our Passover lamb has been sacrificed for us. That's the story we need to tell. Amen? Ooh. Amen? All right now. All right now. That's right. So the next thread is, connecting it to substitution and sacrifice, the next thread is universal need. Universal need. We need to hear this as the body of Christ. One of the wonderful effects of proclaiming and embracing and realizing this reality is that it should keep us so humble, friends. So humble. Listen, the Israelites were not saved because they smelled better than the Egyptians or acted better necessarily or had it more together necessarily. The Israelites were saved because God is good and merciful. Amen? Amen? Here's how Tim Chester puts it. The Israelites had to daub the blood on the doorpost precisely because they were as guilty as the Egyptians. And so needed a substitute to die in their place if they were to avoid the judgment of death. The blood is daubed around the doors, not because God can't tell who's inside, but because He can. He knows there are sinners inside. Can you imagine if the morning after the Passover, one of the Israelites, Israelite dads comes out of his house and he's like, you know what? I know why God spared my place last night. Have you seen it? It's a nice house. Can you imagine that? The family of God is full of brothers and sisters who stand on level ground. And that ground, the night after that Passover, when people came out of their homes and they said, Whew, praise God, I'm alive. You better b- believe that was a level ground, brothers and sisters. Are you with me? There are no gradations in the body of Christ. I remember not too long ago, speaking to another minister from another denomination, this minister said to me, you know what, we're just more inclusive than your church is in our approach to things. Friends, there is no more inclusive position than to say all need the gospel, all need repentance, and all may come to faith in Jesus Christ and be received there. Amen? That is is the most inclusive position. There are no amateurs. There are no professionals, pastors included. I am not a professional Christian. God help me if I think so. And you are not amateurs. You are brothers and sisters in Christ. There are only forgiven sinners made into Saints, so does the way that we treat one another in the body of Christ proclaim this reality? Passover lamb 
helps us to see that the ground is level. Understanding that this is at the heart of Christianity also helps us to remember that we are not here this morning because we are better than others outside of the body. Yes, of course, we should be better than we were if we've been around long, right? Because God's love is a transforming love. But we did nothing to draw ourselves to God. We had no power to liberate ourselves from sin and death. God had all the power. And he poured out that power in grace and mercy upon our heads. Remembering the Passover lamb who points to the Passover lamb brings us back again and again to the level ground at the foot of the cross. Are you there this morning, brother or sister? Brother and sister. Are you there with the forgiven saints in your universal need? There's that great hymn, Beneath the cross of Jesus. Beneath the cross of Jesus. That's exactly what God says to us this morning as we look at the Passover. Stay here. That's all he told, that's all he told the Israelites to do. Stay here. Wait under the blood. Abide here. And you will be safe. From the hymn, Upon the cross of Jesus, mine eye at times can see the very dying form of one who suffered there for me. And from my stricken heart with tears, two wonders I confess, the wonders of redeeming love and my unworthiness. I take, O cross, thy shadow for my abiding place. I ask no other sunshine than the sunshine of his face. Content to let the world go by, to know no gain nor loss, my sinful self, my only shame, my glory, all the cross. That is the universal need. That is the level ground of the cross and the Passover. And lastly, there's shared identity. It's the last thread I want to pull out this morning. Shared identity. You know, the people of Israel, they were to eat the Passover lamb and they were to share in it together. And even in Exodus, you hear how uh, this is a, an instruction manual for how to do it again and again. Or at least the beginnings of an instruction manual. It was to be done for all generations. Chapter 13, verses 8 to 10 is especially important here. As they ate also of the unleavened bread together, this was, I love to say, I heard someone say this as I was studying, this is the world's first fast food meal. Take it with your, with your garments ready to go. Take the lamb, take the bread, and get out of here. Back to the point. As they ate the unleavened bread together, the fathers were told, you shall tell your son on that day. It is because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt, and it shall be to you as a sign on your hand and as a memorial between your eyes that the law of the Lord may be in your mouth. For with a strong hand, the Lord has brought you, son, out of Egypt. You shall therefore keep the statue at its appointed time from year, year to year. So first, when each successive generation of Jews came together to celebrate the Exodus, they were there. Do you hear that in those words? It was as if they were there under the Passover blood, uh, eating the fast food, ready to leave Egypt. They were part of what happened. In the Passover time, history, and eternity, they collide as God rescues the people of Israel, how much more then, how much more then, in the fulfillment of the Passover, the Lord's Supper. In the Lord's Supper, Jesus says to us, this is my body, this is my blood given for you. Take, eat, drink, share in me, abide in me, find refuge in me. Understand, when Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me, it is a completely weak translation of the Greek to just think that that means I'm just remembering a distant event. In fact, the, the Greek, anamnesis, means something like this. Do this and I will be there. I'm there. I'm with you. 
this morning as you celebrate. I'm in you. I'm feeding you. I'm nourishing you because I'm the true Passover lamb. In Holy Communion, there is a real, intimate sharing in Christ's person and work, what we call a real presence. Real presence. Second, let's talk about this for a sec. Notice here in chapter 13, 8 to 10, it assumes that children will be part of the meal. Uh Uh-oh, it's getting out his stirring stick. (laughs) It assumes that children will be part of the meal. Now, this is part of the rationale for baptizing the children of believers. I want you to see here, as you look at the instructions for the uh, Passover, it was unthinkable that children should be sent away during the Passover meal. I find it unthinkable that the children of the church in the early church, for instance, in, in the Corinthian church, were not at the table. They were. They were there at the table too, as they are, and they were in the Passover. Why? Well, just one of the reasons. I'm not being exhaustive here this morning at all. But one of the reasons is why they should be there, why they should receive the sacraments of the church, the visible signs of God's grace, is that it will catechize them, and they will be part of it. What do children inevitably do? They ask why. Why are we doing this? Can't I just go play a video game or read a book? Why, what, is, what are we doing here? One of the reasons why we bring them to the table, we sign the grace of God on them in baptism, we bring them to the table, is so that we may answer them because we were once slaves and are slaves no longer. You see, there's a, there's a back and a forth, a question and an answer, a formation in the faith that happens as our, t- our children gather with us, as families gather together around the table. There's a formation in faith, and they are part of it. They are not meant, I believe, to be at the edges. The children of believers are meant to share in this. God intends for our children to be formed at the table We may tend to undervalue the power of ritual and ceremony. Evangelical Christians are, you know, particularly touchy about this. But we just have to note, the God of the Scriptures doesn't. That's not his thing. That's our thing that we made up. And note, our culture also doesn't doubt the power of ceremony and ritual to form our children and us, too. How many times have you been trying to watch a uh, free movie off of some app and you have to sit through like 10 of the same advertisement just to do it. All I wanted to do was watch a free movie. Is that too much to ask? And you have to watch the same advertisement for the same thing 10 times. What's going on? Our culture knows that repetition and patterns form us. The question is, do we in the pews, do we as the church know that the patterns we give our children, negative or positive, will also form them? Amen? Bring them to the table, folks. Bring them to the table. They should be here. So come today. Come find your substitution and your sacrifice. Come be covered in the blood of the Lamb afresh. Come to the level foot of the cross. Come to the meal shared by all God's people. In heaven and on earth, stretching across time and piercing through to eternity. Let us come today as we revel in the Exodus.